Those of you who listen to radio in this country will know the name of Rabbi Lionel Blue, one of our Jewish rabbis who tells many stories. One of them is about two men who bumped into each other as they were going to a place of worship. The first man said to the second man, what are you going in to pray for? And the second man said, well, I'm hard up. I'm going to ask God for five pounds. So the second, second man said, well, I'm broke as well, um, but I'm going to ask God for half a million pounds. So the, the, the man who was going to ask for half a million pounds said, look, I think I can sort, sort this one out. He took out his wallet, he took out a five pound note and gave it to the other man and said, now, look, here's the five pounds you were going to pray for. Go away and don't bother the Lord about this. So when the, the second man had gone away happily with his five pounds, the first man went in to this house of prayer, lifted up his hands and looked to heaven and said, Lord, now that I've got your undivided attention, <laughs> there are many people who think it's hard to get God's attention. And there are some who believe that uh, even when they do get his attention, that, that he may not want to be bothered with them. Abraham had a problem. As we heard in our uh, first reading this morning, the Chica read to us. Um, Abraham was praying for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were people who had a bit of a reputation for wickedness. And Abraham wasn't at all sure whether they deserved God's blessing and help and whether God would be able to do something for them. Moreover, of course, they weren't part of the Hebrew people. He wasn't sure whether God wanted to bless them. But he pleaded with great determination and with intensity for these two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Of course, he had a vested interest in this, and the reason why he had a vested interest in this was because his nephew Lot had decided to go and live in that place. The time had come earlier in the story, you may remember, when both Abraham and Lot had become very rich and plenty of family and cattle and goodness knows what. They needed plenty of space, and they decided to part ways and spread out. And Abraham gave Lot the choice as to where he might go, the first choice. And Lot chose the plain of Jordan, which was rich and fertile, but it included these cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, which had a reputation for great immorality. So Abraham prays for Sodom and Gomorrah, particularly because his nephew and his family are there. And his prayer is a bit reminiscent of the purchaser at a market stall, isn't it? Be trying to beat down a stallholder in price. Uh, he prayed and pleaded for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to be saved from destruction. If only there might be 50 people found there who were good and righteous. And when he discovers that God's mercy will save the city for the sake of 50, he decides perhaps he better lower the bar a bit, and he says, well, what about if there are only 40? And so it goes down and down, 30, 20, 10. One biblical commentator has pointed out, uh, what is amazing is how his courage increases during this conversation, as God's grace is willing. How he stretches the capacity for God's righteousness with great audacity, until he arrives at the astonishing fact that a very small number of innocent people are more important in God's sight than the majority of sinners. In that prayer, Abraham discovers something essential about the nature of God, his will to save over and above his will to punish. Abraham's compassion for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah reveals, of course, the heart of a man who cared greatly for others, including those who didn't follow God. But it also tells us something about his unsureness, his view of God. He wasn't sure of God's mercy, and he felt that God needed to be persuaded and bargained with. This whole business of having to persuade people and having to engage in bargaining in life is something that's there with us virtually all through life. And I was reminded the other day in a very simple incident uh, how it starts at a very early age. I was taking our youngest grandson, who's four and a half, uh, to the park, and uh, he was engaging in his favorite activity of being on the swings, and I was pushing him. And uh, he suddenly said, uh, can my brother and me come to, to dinner with you and Nanny tonight? I said, well, you can't come tonight, I'm afraid, because we're going out. 
but another day. I know how he loves coming to us. And so I decided to pull his leg. And he always knows when I'm having a joke with him. I said, well, how would you like to come and live with Nanny and me and never see your mummy and daddy again? And he stopped swinging and he looked up and he said, I'll do your deal. <laughs> I thought, four and, a half, four and a half years of age, I'll do you a deal. I said, what's this then? He said, I'll come and live with your nanny for two weeks. I'll go and live with mummy and daddy for two weeks. And I'll go and live with Nana and Grandpa for two weeks. I said, oh. <laughs> and then I thought, well, goodness gracious me. If bargaining starts as early as this, who teaches them? It is almost something innate in human nature, isn't it? That we feel that need to bargain, to push with people, because somehow we feel that they won't want to give us what it is we're asking for. We're not on very safe ground. We live with that kind of attitude daily, I guess, throughout our lives. And it's there in, at every level of our life, isn't it? In the family, in our places of work, in the communities where we engage in our politics and in international relationships as well. In order to get something done, we feel the need to have some kind of a trade-off with people or another group of people. And the cause of this sort of attitude, of course, is that somehow we assume that everybody else is going to be interested in only looking after their own interests and not have any interest in looking after our concerns. We live with that kind of attitude every day. But when it spills over into our relationship with God, it's actually very sad. Back in the 1880s, long before any of us were alive, uh, we had a rising cricket star in this country known as Charles T. Studd. He was a very uh, brilliant cricketer. Came from a wealthy family, he had a good education, and the result of, as a result of one of the great Moody and Sankey campaigns that took part in this country at the time, um, his father became a Christian. And Charles and his brother soon followed and became Christians sometime afterwards. But his adherence to the Christian faith was rather nominal, nominal and a bit, uh, bit shaky. And one day his brother George became seriously ill. Charles was very fond of his brother and he took to prayer and he pleaded with God earnestly. He said, God, if you make my brother better, then I will go to China as a missionary for you. If you do this, I'll do that. Well, his brother was healed. Charles did go to China. He was a very effective missionary in China. And later on, he had many links with several countries in Africa. And he was instrumental in setting up what became known later as the Worldwide Evangelization Crusade. But the important thing is that he slowly learned a different way of praying not based on bargaining and bartering with God. Sure, most of us are familiar with the Old Testament story of Jacob, one of the patriarchs. You remember the story of Jacob, which takes about 20 or 30 years to unfold, as it's told in the Old Testament. And as that story unfolds, we find a significant development in his relationship with God. And during the course of those years, he learned a different way of praying. As a young man, we're told about how he left home. And he left home because there'd been a right rumpus. He'd uh, cheated his brother out of the birthright, his older brother out of the birthright. He deceived his father because his father was old and going blind and didn't know which son he was dealing with, with the connivance of his mother. And eventually he escaped. He ran away. And when he stopped running for long enough to catch his breath and thought about where he was going, he addressed God. And in that prayer, as a very young man, having had a real family up and a downer, he says to God, if God will be with me on this journey, and if God will watch over me, and if God will give me enough food and clothes to eat, and if God will bring me safe home again, if God will do these things, then God will be my God, and I will build him an altar. He's a frightened young man with a hard way and an unknown way ahead of him, and he thinks he can bribe God. He's prepared to make it 
worth God's while to help him prosper. But fast forward 20 or 30 years towards the end of this story of Jacob. And some 20 or more years later, after many twists and turns in the story, Jacob is on his way home again, planning and preparing with some apprehension to meet his brother. This time, of course, he has, he's married, wives, children, plenty of cattle. But this time his prayer, as he prays on the way home, takes a very different kind of tone. And what he says to God on this occasion is, God, I am unworthy of all the kindness and the faithfulness that you've shown to me. Save me from the hand of my brother Esau. You notice it's a very different tone of approach, isn't it? No bargaining, no bartering, no promises of being obedient to God as long as God will do something for him but simply an awareness that God had been more gracious to him than he ever deserved. And when we turn to the New Testament, of course, we find that Jesus helps us to build in our minds a, a very different picture of God. And in that gospel passage that uh, Charlie read to us just now, Jesus is telling, very, telling us very eloquently what God is not like. God is not a God who is unwilling to help us. God is not a God who needs to be bargained with or cajoled, but a God who's rich in mercy. He's not a God who wants to exact from us lots of demands, but a God who wants to give us many good gifts. He's not a God who doesn't know what we need, but a God who can give us better gifts than we could ever have imagined. And rather, he is the God who is more willing to hear than we are ever to pray. And he is the God who is able to do more for us than we could ever imagine or ask for. And Jesus talked to us in words about the nature of God and his willing to give us many things more than we deserve and to give us the very thing that we need more than anything else, his, the presence of his Holy Spirit in our hearts and lives. But Jesus did more than just talk about it. Jesus not only talked about this willing, generous God who is so prepared to put himself out for us, but he demonstrated in all that he did and all that he suffered, actually just how good God is. And where does that leave us? Well, it means that we don't have to see prayer as a struggle. We don't have to see it as some kind of exercise in the marketplace where we're trying to barter with an unwilling God. We don't have to be in the business of wheeling and dealing. It means we don't have to be bargainers where God is concerned, but merely responders. And we need to trust those words that Jesus spoke. And when we come to God in prayer, we need to come, as Paul put it in his letter to the Romans, with eyes wide open to the mercies of God. Let me finish by telling you a story, a story about a man who'd become thoroughly infected with the world of wheeling and dealing. He was a man I knew about 30 years ago, and uh, it, it related to a place where I lived and uh, linked to a church where I was the minister. And one of his daughters came and asked me if I would marry her to the man of her dreams that she'd met while she was working in an African country. She was in her 30s and she was so delighted that she'd found this lovely man to be married to. Sadly, her mother had died uh, and her father by this time had, was suffering considerably from senile dementia. But he was a master butcher by trade and he'd spent 40 or 50 years in the world of business and it had made him materialistic and hard-bitten and this was deeply ingrained in him. So we got to the day of the wedding and uh, I'd said to her in the preparations, I said, now what are you going to do about dad on the wedding day? I said, because he won't really know what's going on, how are you going to include him? She said, well, we've got a plan. So the day of the wedding arrived and uh, the bridegroom, the best man were there, all the guests were there. And then the, uh, the bride turned up in a wonderful uh, open top limousine uh, and uh, she said to me, is dad here yet? I said, no, he hasn't arrived. 
She said, well, I'll get the driver to drive us round the block. So they disappeared for five minutes. They came back, and uh, this time we could just see Dad coming into view uh, some distance off with this next-door neighbour who was kindly bringing him up. So they approached the church. By this time, the bride had got out of the car with the uh, relative who was going to be giving her away. The chauffeur was standing there. There was a little crowd outside the church, and I was waiting to greet them and take them in the church. <clears throat> Father walked up to the church. He didn't see this great crowd standing outside the church. He didn't even see his daughter standing there looking absolutely radiant in her wedding gown. All he saw was the lovely open-topped limousine. And he went up and examined it all the way around. And then he went to the chauffeur and he said, I'll give you a fiver for it, Gov. <laughs> Life for that man had been a constant stream of wheeling, dealing, economic activity, bargaining, always trying to get the best of a deal, whether it was property or whether it was meat. It wasn't just wrong. It was very, very sad because in this occasion, he missed the magic of his daughter's wedding, one of the great days of his life. And if we have an inbuilt attitude that tells us that prayer is about bargaining and bartering with God, trying to prize things out of an unwilling deity, it's not just wrong, it's sad, because we shall miss the magic and the wonder of how God is already constantly blessing us in so many ways. The God that Jesus speaks about is the God and the Father who knows what we need, who's more willing to hear than we are to pray, and more willing to give us far more than we can ever ask or even imagine. Thanks be to God. Amen.